A blue wolf took as his spouse a fallow doe. They settled at the head of the Onon River to raise their offspring, and there were born the Mongols. So begins my life's work, the secret history of the Mongols. I have been selected to compose this epic because great events are about to take place. We are going to leave Mongolia. I have lived always on this frigid, dry, and endless steppe. The tribes here squabble like vultures fighting over the desiccated corpse of a marmot. We fight over limited resources, scarce water, few trees, sparse grass for our herds to graze on. A wise and dangerous man named Temujin means to change all this. He says that if the tribal conflict is to end, the Mongols require but two things. First, we need green pastures for our herds. With more to go around, there will be less competition among tribes. Second, we are a culture of warriors. We need a common enemy with which to do battle. To meet both these needs, Temujin has come up with the most modest of schemes, to unite the tribes and go to war with anyone who stands in our path. How, we ask him, how can nomadic horsemen in felt tents embark on a campaign of world conquest? Temujin replies that we will not fight as warriors, but as a unified army. We fight not for personal glory, but for the glory of the Horde. And with those words, the name of Temujin has passed into almost obscurity. His name is replaced with the title Great Khan, Genghis Khan. Behold, the horde of Genghis Khan approaches. You men, you will visit each of the outlying tribes. You must convince as many as you can to join our glorious army. But beware the Karakitai. They are without honor. Four Mongol tribes now follow the banner of Genghis Khan. The rest of the world will soon know true fear. We will follow you if you can prove to us that you are favored by the Sky God. Bring to us a holy relic. Nearly all of the Mongol tribes have united under the Great Khan. The chieftains of those tribes reluctant to join were boiled alive. Each day, new faces have taken up the bow. Unfamiliar hands hold the nine bands of yak hair that has become Genghis' standard. There are more men and horses gathered in the camp than I ever knew existed. Horse archers and lancers, men in leather cuirass and silk armor, all lift their heads upward to the platform from where Genghis speaks. The Great Khan calls himself the Punishment of God. Men smile like hungry wolves. It is dawn on the first day of the Mongol Empire. Winter has come to the steppes. The earth is frozen hard as bone, and the only movement is the steam rising from the nostrils of men and horses. Only the promise of battle brings warmth. Nearly all of the tribes in Mongolia now answer to Genghis Khan, but with success comes enemies. A man named Kushluk has challenged Genghis' right to rule. Kushluk sows discord among the Karakatai Khanate and means to have himself proclaimed as a rival Khan. Genghis cannot allow these transgressions to go unpunished. He needs to set an example. So we ride west to find and slay Kushluk. If the Karakatai shelter him, then their lives are forfeit as well. spotted a Tai Chud village to the north. Perhaps the inhabitants can be persuaded to join us. Don't hurt us. We can aid 
in your blood feud. Timo. Bushlock is our guest. It would be most rude for us to send him away. Run away! Run away! <laughs> Such is the vengeance of the great Khan. Genghis Khan knows that there are weapons aside from the lance and bow. He is a master of mental warfare. Just as he is made an example of Kushnuk, he makes examples of enemy lands. When we first encounter a new adversary, the Great Khan spares no one. We ride to the closest town, slay every living thing, burn down the city, sow the fields with salt, and make a mountain of enemy skulls. After that, the other towns are quick to send forth their emissaries, eager to placate the ravenous Mongol hordes. Now, all of Mongolia is in the grasp of Genghis Khan. Beyond are two vast empires, China to the east and Persia to the west. Persia is the sensible choice of battle, since it separates us from the rich forage pastures in Europe. But first, Genghis Khan has another score to settle. After witnessing the power of our cavalry in action, the Chinese spoke of nothing but peace. They even promised support for our campaign westward. But now that we have turned away from China, they have decided not to deliver the men and arms they promised Genghis. It is time for another demonstration. Persia can wait as the horde wheels east once more, and we prepare to march into China, the largest, most advanced empire in the world. Great Khan, we have captured a transport ship. Mongols, run for your lives!
great Khan. With these engineers, we can establish a strong in China and construct powerful engines of destruction. <laughs>
glorious slaughter. For years, visitors to China will be astounded by the mountain of human and horse skeletons that we have erected. Genghis's horde has gained one huge advantage by this invasion of China, technology. We now possess the knowledge and equipment to allow us to make siege weapons. We will crack open the Persian and European castles to reach the softer parts within. Genghis is pleased with our progress and with the legacy he leaves behind. His mother once ate wild onions and rodents to keep from starving. But the children and grandchildren of Genghis will eat off plates of Persian gold. Sleep in the saddle, drink the rain, eat nothing but dried meat, dried milk, and horse blood. Such is the life of a Mongol at war. At night, we are rewarded with fermented yak's milk and the promise of Persian treasures. Driven on by the words of the great Khan, we have crossed miles of the Asian continent at full gallop. Before us lies the vast empire of Persia. The Khwarezm Shah will be given one chance to submit, and then his cities will be pulled down brick by brick. But not all of us head into Persia. Genghis has sent Sobotai Batur of the reindeer people north into Russia. The Russian principalities are disorganized, and Genghis hopes that Sobotai can break them one by one. Then the Horde will rule all of Asia. Great Khan. Our assassins are concealed in these trade carts. Once the carts are near the Persian Shah, the assassins will strike. Without their leader, the Persians will fall like grass beneath our hooves. We come bearing gifts for the Shah. You may enter. Our city of Samarkand is just over that hill. And what have the Mongols sent me? No doubt a bribe begging me not to destroy them. Quickly, we must strike at the Shah! What is this? Treachery! Now the Persians will be an easier target! We die for Genghis Khan! Beep.
The Persian army numbered nearly half a million men, but was beaten by a Mongol army less than half that size. The governors of outlying cities were executed by pouring molten silver into their eyes and throats. The capital city of Samarkand, which was expected to withstand our siege for a full year, fell in five days. Separate mountains were made of the skulls of men, women, children, horses, dogs, and cats. We roamed the streets in wonder at the opulence of the Persians, drinking at their fountains and gorging ourselves on sherbet and tropical fruit. For a man born in a tent, it seemed as if Genghis Khan had torn open the gates to heaven itself. Russia and Mesopotamia were now ours to command. The empire now stretched over 7,000 miles, from the Pacific Ocean to the Black Sea. We were about to enter Europe when tragedy struck. Old wolves do not die gracefully. Warriors their whole lives, they do not know how to live when they grow old and their fangs fall out. Such it is with Mongols as well. Genghis Khan was now 80 years old. On the night when we knew our glorious conquest was about to end, Genghis summoned his sons to his tent. They found their father shivering before a fire, delirious with pain. My descendants will wear gold, he said. They will eat the finest meals and ride the finest horses and forget to whom they owe it all. A deed is not glorious until it is finished. And he refused to die until Ogadai, his third son, promised to continue the war. Ogadai emerged from the tent, carrying his father's bow, and declared, This storm is not yet finished. I hear the sound of lightning, and it strikes in Poland. The church bells rang in Europe when they saw our horde pouring out of the mountains. The armies of Bohemia and Germany hastened to Poland's defense. To them, our army might have been from the underworld itself, still commanded by the shade of the Great Khan. Lord Ogatai, King Winterstas is approaching with a huge army. Scouts have located a region in the pass ahead where we can make our stand. If we build strong fortifications, we will smash their army against our walls and towers.
Ахер. И болгой. Цвете. Бердехчин. 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 We have completed the castles. We are ready to withstand the assault of King Wenceslas and his Bohemian knights. Flag captured.
Bohemian flag capture. All three flags captured. We are victorious. fight as individuals, but Mongols fight as part of a united army. Laden down with armor, the Polish and Germans could not catch our quick-footed horses. Time and again, we fired flaming arrows at them, then retreated out of range. When the enemy cavalry pursued, we would lead them into an ambush. The ambush was always announced by the Nakara, a huge drum carried into battle on a camel. A hundred times, a hundred times has the Nakara sounded on this day. We were ordered to cut off an ear of every victim. Nine large sacks of ears were sent back to Ogadai Khan. Only one power stands in our way. France and the kingdoms beyond are beaten from decades of crusades. If we break Eastern Europe, then it is likely that all of Western Europe will surrender. But to break the East, we must defeat Hungary. Hungary possesses the most formidable cavalry in all of Europe. They have not only the strength of European armor, but their horses are cousins to our own, having drifted in from across the Russian steppes. The Saho River that separates us from the army of Hungary is frozen, so we will be unable to deploy boats. Instead, the battle will be won or lost over who controls the bridge. Sabutai is coming with reinforcements. If we can survive the charge of the Hungarian knights until Sobotai arrives, then we can hope to take the bridge. Much rests on this simple bridge. If we capture the Saho crossing, we capture Hungary. If Hungary falls, so falls Europe. With Europe and Asia under Mongol control, our conquest of the world will be complete and final. Lord Ogadai, we must hold off the Hungarians until Subutai arrives. He will be here in 40 minutes. Just get us close enough to an enemy building, and we will give our lives for the cause.
Subutai and his men have arrived in the east. Hungarians are trying to blow up the Sajo River Bridge. Thank you. 
Such is the fate of the Hungarians and all who would oppose the tribes of Mongolia. Nothing stands between us and the Atlantic Ocean. The Mongol Empire comprises two whole continents. Europe and Asia belong to the hordes. Every place we have entered has changed forever with our passing. Russia, once filled with quarreling city-states, much like the old Mongol tribes, will forever be melded into a single gigantic empire. Genghis Khan forged the largest empire ever created in the life of one man. His body was carried back to the river Onon, where the legendary Blue Wolf and Fallow Doe once lived. He was buried in the ground, and a thousand horsemen rode over the site to disguise it. Genghis Khan's final resting place was devoured by the steppes. My people cherish the legend that their great ruler will one day return to lead his horsemen to another bloody victory. <laughs> 